All right. Uh, so we have, uh, I think, three lectures left, including this one. So I thought I'd do a, a little uh, additive combinatorics for the last couple of lectures. Uh, I should also mention that your projects are due in the last day of class, which is in one week. Uh, okay, so what is additive combinatorics? Uh, it's a topic that's a bit hard to describe. More often it takes place in the, okay, it usually takes place in groups. Uh, more often it takes place in the setting of the group of integers. Uh, well, we'll do it, you know, over f2 to the n because that's our favorite setting. And I guess that's about these questions like, um, I don't know, like arithmetic progressions or like if you have like a set of integers and you look at everything you can get by adding two integers from the set, what is the structure of the new set you get, or adding or multiplying two integers from the set. Um, you know, it's a study maybe of what it means to be like an approximate subgroup of your, of your domain. Uh, I don't know, it's a little hard to define, but it has some of these things. Um, so, uh, we're going to do it in the setting of f2 to the n, and we're going to mostly talk about this issue of sort of what it means to be an approximate subgroup in this, this group. You should think of f2 to the n either as a group or it's also a vector space over the field f2 to the n, uh, over the field f2. And um, somehow the philosophy of additive combinatorics is a little bit different from the philosophy of the, like, the Fourier analysis we've been doing so far. So, ways in which it uh, are a little bit different uh, include the following. Um, in additive combinatorics, you mostly study, you know, sums of elements and in particular concepts that are invariant under linear transformations of the underlying group. Okay, and so if you're studying concepts invariant under these linear transformations, it means that if you look at the Fourier characters, in additive combinatorics, they're all like equally meaningful to you, except for the zero one, that's a special one, but otherwise all you l normally treat all the Fourier characters the same. And that's a bit different from what we've done mostly so far, where we have this pretty strict stratification of the Fourier characters by their Hamming weight or their degree. And there was a notion of like low degree characters and um, you know, noise sensitivity and stability had to do with degree. And there were dictators. And out of combinatorics, you don't have any of that. Somehow every character is equally valid. Uh, another somewhat difference in philosophy is that, especially when we talked about like learning and uh, property testing, if you had like a, a function, you mostly didn't mind ignoring, or you mostly didn't care too much if two functions agreed up to some set of ep a measure epsilon, okay? Or you often thought of a function whose two norm as epsilon as being somehow negligible. But in additive combinatorics, there aren't really negligible sets like that. I mean, you're quite interested in subsets of, let's say, f2 to the n that have density 2 to the minus root n, and you, know, you can't just ignore such sets. Um, some of the tools that are important are in additive combinatorics are convolution and probability density functions. You see a lot of density increment arguments or regularity lemma arguments. So all of this is, you know, an attempt to sort of define additive combinatorics. Um, it's a little hard to define. Anyway, we'll start solving some problems that count as being in the area today. Okay, so let's talk a little bit sort of about this notion of approximate subgroups. So I'm going to introduce some notation that's useful in this uh, area. We'll often be talking about like subsets of the vector space f2 to the n. And usually to avoid some trivialities, we'll make sure they're not empty. Um, so for such subsets, uh, we'll often use this notation 1a. That's the function which is the indicator of the set. And even better, I like, you know, this phi A, which we've seen before from the homework, uh, which is the uh, probability density function for the uniform distribution on A. Okay, and one more piece of annotation which uh, I will employ is something for the denominator here. We say that the density of A, or maybe the volume of A, uh, is, we'll write it as mu A, and it's just the expectation of the indicator, or in other words, sort of the fractional size of A. Okay, so I'll use this notation mu of A a lot. 
OK, so perhaps the most basic uh, thing that they like to study in additive combinatorics, or we like to study in additive combinatorics, is the sum set. OK, so uh, given, let's say, two sets, A and B, in F2 to the n, although we'll mostly think about the case where A equals B, uh, their sum set is denoted A plus B, and it's just the set of all things that you can achieve by adding up uh, one thing from A and one thing from B. OK. Uh, F2 is actually a particularly pleasant place to do arithmetic combinatorics because addition and subtraction are the same. So uh, we don't even have to worry about the distinction between a different set and a sum set. All right, so uh, let's look at what happens if you look at A plus A. And suppose this set A plus A equals, again, the set A. And what does this mean about the set A? Well, in words, you would say, oh, if this occurs, it means A is closed under addition, right? A is closed under addition. OK, and we kind of know that in a group, that's sort of the definition of uh, A is a subgroup of F2 to the n. If you think of it as a group, or if you think of it as a vector space, it means it's a subspace. OK, that's well and good. Uh, let me just remind you about, um, let's say, the subspace notation. So uh, here's an example of a subspace. You can think of the subspace as either the additive span of a bunch of vectors. So I mean, maybe I'll take the span of, let's say, I'll just take one vector, the 1, 1 vector. So the span is all possible linear combinations. So that would give you 0, 0, that's a linear combination, and 1, 1, and there's nothing else you can get. So you can uh, you know, give a, a subspace by a basis or the span of uh, some vectors. Or another common way to give it is by uh, giving it as the perpendicular space of some vectors. Okay? So everything that's orthogonal to something. Okay, in particular, this is actually equal to everything that's orthogonal to 1, 1. OK, and so uh, actually in, in finite fields, as opposed to in the real case, uh, it can be that a subspace like this one is actually equal to its perpendicular space. That's something which you're not normally used to in uh, finite fields, and that tripped up some people on one of the homeworks. Um, OK, so that's, that's fine. That's what happens when a set is closed under addition. Now let's look at something similar. What would happen if... I didn't tell you that A plus A equaled A, but I just tell you that it has the same size or the same density as A. So what does this imply? Well, uh, you might guess, perhaps, that it implies the same thing. But that's not uh, correct. Do you know what else can happen if A plus A has the same size as A? Yes, it could be. Uh, it could be. It turns out that this is equivalent to A is not a subspace, but an affine subspace. I think with this uh, notion was introduced on the homework, or in the group theoretic uh, terminology, this is a coset. Okay, so it's everything of the form, you know, X plus H, where H is a subspace. OK, so an example of a coset, let's say if n equals 2, would be, let's say, 1, 0 plus, if I call this h, 1, 0 plus h, which is the set 1, 0, and 0, 1. OK, and you can see that this thing, it's not closed under addition, but um, the sum set, in this case, a plus a, equals h, right? You can achieve these things. So it's of the same size. 
Okay, so it's, e it's very easy to check that if you are a, a coset, then uh, if you're a coset of the form x plus h, then x plus h plus x plus h is the same thing as h plus h, which is h, and that has size, this has size cardinality of h, and this also has size cardinality of h. So if it's a coset or an affine subspace, these things are the same size, and it's actually if and only if that's an exercise. Okay, any questions so far? We're going to be talking about like subspaces and affine subspaces and so forth a lot, so. Okay. All right, so that's fine. Uh, we know that if you take a set A and you form the subset and it doesn't grow at all, then it must be because you're literally a, an affine subspace. So, okay, on this theme of approximate group theory, you might ask well, what happens if it's, let's say, a little bit bigger, let's say, say A is some set and mu of the density or size of A plus A is, let's say, a little bit bigger than A. Your five-fourths is like a random number that's like slightly bigger than one. Um, then what can you say about A? Okay, well, what I want to tell you is, uh, I want to explain to you that you can't really say anything at all interesting about A by itself. And, yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry, this notation here, less than or equal to in, uh, in vector space notation means H is a subspace. Yeah. Okay, so I want to explain, uh, give you a little result that shows that in some sense you can't say much about A itself. Um, so here's a little claim, which I'll use later. Uh, so let H be a subspace of F2 to the N. You know, in our old-fashioned terminology, it's like an and of parodies. Uh, and let A be any subspace set of H with sort of relative density at least a half. So A sits inside H, and let's say its relative density inside H is at least a, or strictly bigger than a half. The claim is that A plus A equals H. So this is an easy claim, and I'll explain why in a second it has something to do with this question. The proof is a very simple pigeonhole principle argument. Um, okay, certainly A plus A is a subset of H, okay, because A is inside H and H is closed under addition, so A plus A has to be inside H, so we need to show the reverse containment, that anything in H is in A plus A, so let's let X be an arbitrary element of H, we want to show that it's in A plus A. Well, uh, let's look at X plus A. Okay, this is actually sort of using this sum set notation where X is just a singleton set. Well, X plus A is you just take everything in the set A and add X to it. So it just shifts everything around. It has the same cardinality or the same density as A. So we also have that X plus A um, uh, has density greater than or equal to a half. Uh, eh, wait, there's something fishy in this argument that I wanted to say. I'm a little confused here. Somebody should help me out because I wanted to say that, you know, now you have two sets inside H of density at, at least a half, so they should overlap. And that will give you your points. So that will give you your two points in A that add up to X. But I'm confused because X plus A. Sorry? Yeah, I wanted to say that, you know, therefore, X plus A has to intersect A. So, 
So uh, you know there exists a and a, and b and this a, such that x plus little a equals b, i.e. a plus b equals x. So there I've written x as the sum of two things in a. Uh, but at this instant, I'm getting confused because Half, right, but x plus a as a set is not sitting inside h. Okay, good, good. Phew, okay, good. I was having a hard time figuring that out, great. So not only is its relative density greater than a half, like it's in h, because x is in h and a is in h, and h is close under addition. Phew, okay, good. Almost dropped the ball there. Okay, so this was uh, this non-emptiness was because of the pigeonhole. Okay, I think I was the last person to follow that proof, but I guess now we all have. Okay, good. So, uh, all right. So this is a good thing to remember. Like once you have a subset of let's say more than half of a, a subgroup, if you form the sum set, you get everything. Okay, so what does that have to do with this claim? or this question up here. Well, what I want to say is uh, let H be any subset. Okay, and let A be an arbitrary, I don't know, four-fifths of the elements of H. Okay, completely arbitrary subset of four-fifths of the elements. Then A is inside H. We know that A plus A equals H by this little claim. So therefore, you know, the density of A plus A, which is the density of H, is at most five quarters the density of A. Okay, and so it it doesn't sort of tell you that much because here A could be totally arbitrary. It's a subset of H. So you can't really say much about A, but you can say that in this case, you know, well, maybe I won't make a conclusion directly about A, but I can conclude that uh, maybe A plus A is a subspace. But if, you know, uh, you know, A need not look like a subspace if it's sort of almost close under addition, but like maybe A plus A is like a subspace. And this is true. Uh, here are two theorems. This first one is due to Freiman. It's not very hard. That this actually holds, I think, in any abelian group that if A plus A is at most three halves the density of A, then A plus A is a subspace. Let me say subgroup. Uh, that holds, I think, in any abelian group. And you can get something that's like a little bit stronger if you're specific to F2. The end still holds even if this is uh, 1.75. instead of three halves. And this one's a bit harder than this theorem, but it's elementary. Okay, so this kind of tells us something, you know, nice. If A is a set such that its sum set is not too much bigger than itself. Okay, if A plus A is at most, I don't know, 1.75 times the density of A, then it sort of has to be because A plus A is a subgroup. Okay, so that's an interesting fact, and we haven't really used anything too sophisticated, or you don't use anything too sophisticated to prove it. Um, but now let's kind of ask ourselves a harder question, and this harder question is the, be the one that preoccupies us for today's class and also the next class. Uh, what if I tell you a much weaker statement, like this is when you're sort of almost close under addition. What if you're sort of mm, weakly almost closed under addition in size. So what if the density of A plus A 
is at most a thousand times the density of A. Okay, now can you say something about A plus A? Now, now does it force some kind of structure on, on A plus A, you might ask. Well, this is a much more uh, subtle question, so let me go over some possibilities. In fact, let me, everything is, all the difficulties of this question is already wrapped up in a special case. It's kind of an equally interesting special case. One way this can happen is if the density of A is itself at least one over a thousand. Okay, if the density of A is at least one over a thousand, I don't really know what A plus A is, but its density is at most one. So this is an example of a case where the density of the sum set is at most a thousand times the density of the original set. Okay, so if you want to answer this question, you should at least try to answer this question. Just what if you have like a big set and you somehow deduce something about the structure of the sum set A plus A? Okay, and actually it's sort of known due to some theorems of uh, Green and Ruja that often in whatever you can deduce in this case, when you're just studying a big set, you can pull back and get some information about this case when you're just talking about a potentially small set that um, doesn't expand much in size when you form the sum set. Okay, so let's look at this question. You know, what happens to the sum sets of large sets A? So, on this philosophy of structure versus randomness, one thing that could happen is that, this is sort of a case, A might be a random subset of one one thousandth of F2 to the N. Okay, it just might be, you might just pick a one thousandth of the, the points uniformly at random. And then, if you do that, what will A plus A look like? Somebody tell me. Yeah, probably everything. With high probability, uh, it's everything. You know, at, at a first blush or a first glance, you could say, well, look, the size of A is like 1 over 1,000 times 2 to the N. So there are this many squared possibilities for like two things to add up into A which is quite huge, right? I mean, okay, it's one over a million granted, but it's like times two to the two n. So if, if you're not going to get everything in this set, which is only of size two to the n, there would have to be some like insane number of cancellation or like duplications. So that is possible, but it's not possible if really if A is a random set. You know, really for each, to prove this, you just say, look, for each x, uh, you know, there's almost two to the n choices for A, and this is random by itself, so it has a 1 over 1,000th chance of being an A. And, you know, you're making this 1 over 1,000th chance, like 1 over 1,000 times 2 to the n times. So it's very likely to happen. Okay, so this is one possibility. If A is a random set, then you'll just get everything if you take the sum set. Sort of the totally opposite case, this is like the randomness case, this is like the structure case, is A could be a subspace. Okay, that's the case where we know nothing happens if you do the sub sum set. So A is a sub space. Okay, maybe even an affine subspace. And what would the dimension of it be if its volume were one over a thousand? Well, let's 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 change this slightly to 1024. Uh, so then it could be of dimension n minus 10. Okay, I claim that a subspace of dimension n minus 10 has density which is like 2 to the minus 10. Okay, and this, we'll often see something like this, dimension which is almost full, in which case we use this other terminology, co-dimension 10. Okay, the co-dimension of a subspace is just the n minus the dimension. So just to make that more vivid to you, let me give an example of a, a subspace of codimension 10, uh, e.g. 
you know, A could be the span, okay, it has dimension n minus 10, so it could be the span of E11, E12, all the way up to En, you know, where these guys are the things that look like they have a 1 in, Ei has a 1 in the ith coordinate. Um, this is also equal to uh, the set of things which is perpendicular to E1 through E10, okay, if you have a set that's like everything perpendicular to some vectors, and those vectors are linearly independent, then the subspace has co-dimension equal to the number of vectors. Or finally, you might just say it's everything that looks like it's got 10 zeros, and then uh, n minus 10 other possibilities. Okay, so this set right here, everything that starts with 10 zeros, is a subspace, it's closed under addition, its dimension is n minus 10, i.e. its co-dimension is 10, uh, and its density is, you know, 2 to the minus 10, right? Okay, so subspaces of co-dimension k have uh, density 2 to the minus k. So here we, you know, in this case, this is an example of a set with density roughly 1 over 1,000, and here we know that A plus A is not everything, but it equals A. A subspace of uh, co-dimension 10. So if we're thinking about, you know, the possible things that could happen, okay, in this one case you got a subspace of co-dimension 0, you got everything. And here you got a subspace of co-dimension 10, that's pretty good. So, you know, you might naively say, oh, maybe, I don't know, you always get like a a subspace with very high co-dimension, a very low co-dimension. Um, that's not quite true. Let me give you a third example, which somehow doesn't fit into either of these structureness or randomness buckets. And it's a, an example that kind of is more of this flavor of this, uh, all the previous part of the course, analysis of Boolean functions. It's the Hamming ball. So here's another possibility. Uh, maybe A is the set of all strings X such that the Hamming weight of X is at most uh, N over 2 minus, let's say, three standard deviations. Okay, so it's like a Hamming ball centered at 0 where the radius is almost N over 2, but not quite. So it's sort of three standard deviations off. So if you know your Gaussians, then this will be of density roughly 1 over 1,000. Okay, this 1 over 1,000 depends on this 3, but not in a very important way. And what do you get if you form A plus A? What is A plus A for this thing? Pardon me? It's everything that you can achieve by adding up two strings whose Hamming weight is thing that's slightly less than n over 2. Uh, yep. Um, well, can you achieve the all zero string? Right. Can you achieve like a string with Hamming weight 1? Yeah, just take that string of Hamming weight 1, which is in A, and add to it the 0 vector, which is also in A. Uh, so you can achieve anything that's in A. You can also achieve anything with, like, moderate Hamming weight by, like, just making sure the 1's, like, align up in your favor. What are the things you cannot achieve? Yeah, you cannot achieve the all 1 string. You just don't have enough 1's to get it. Uh, okay, so if you continue this, uh, if I were to continue this Socratic questioning for a little while, we would all agree that this set is everything that has Hamming, oops, Hamming weight at most uh, twice this. Okay, I'll leave you to convince yourself of that. And what's going on with this? This thing actually does not contain uh, a like an extremely giant subspace, but it does like contain, you know, virtually everything, right? This contains I don't know, like everything except for like a very tiny fraction of F2 to the N. Okay, the 
fraction of points that have Hemingway bigger than n minus 3 root n is, is tiny. OK, so you might look at these examples, and you might look at some more examples, and you may eventually um, decide that you've seen most of the possibilities here. And you might conjecture that if A is a big set of density, I don't know, 1 over 1,000, then A plus A has to contain, let's say, almost all of a subspace of constant co-dimension. And uh, this is a conjecture. I do not know the name of this conjecture I'm going to write, but I assume it's conjecture. So let me just call it A plus A conjecture. It's slightly stronger than some well-known conjectures. Uh, so here's the conjecture. If A is a set whose density is at least alpha, then let me say A plus A contains, let me just say 99% of a subspace of co-dimension at most, and the best thing I could put here is like log 1 over alpha, right? I mean, A could be a subspace itself. Actually, let me write affine subspace here for safety. Um, okay, let me put O of here just for safety. Okay, and this is consistent with all of these three examples we've seen so far, right? You know, if you generalize 1024 to alpha, then the codimension would be log 1 over alpha. Okay, and this 99% covers, you know, this, this case, too. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, the difference between 3 and 2 is, uh, well, there's, there's two differences, but uh, the difference between 3 and 1 and 2 is that you don't really contain all of a constant co-dimension subspace here. Um, Actually, you have to think a little bit about what's the largest uh, affine subspace that this guy contains. Uh, the largest affine subspace that this guy contains actually has dimension something like n minus root n. So it's pretty big codimension, pretty small codimension, but it's more like root n. It depends on n. Uh, and you see, this theorem is nice because it doesn't mention n anywhere, which is kind of cool. So if you want to sort of have a theorem which includes this case but doesn't mention n, let's say, in the size of the the, the co-dimension of the space you get, then you should go to this almost all statement. Yeah, I don't know. You could indeed try to not just put 99% here, but maybe 1 minus something that depended on alpha and went to 0 with alpha. I'm not sure what the best thing you could try to put there is. Uh, as I said, I haven't actually seen this conjecture written anywhere in the literature, but I think it's generally believed. And maybe, you know, the 99% here is just whatever you would guess based on this example. Actually, but in that case, it would be better than depending on alpha. It would, you know, maybe depend on n. It would be 1 minus something that went to 0 with n. Um, but yeah, I don't exactly know what you might try to put here. Okay, so that's some uh, very strong conjecture, which would be great to resolve. Um, so one thing that you could say about this conjecture is that it would Im certainly imply that A plus A plus A plus A, you know, see A plus A here has 99% of the subspace. And we saw before from this little claim that was over here that even if you have 51% of a subspace, when you add it to yourself, you get the whole subspace. So uh, we call this, I don't know, uh, H, it would contain all of H. Okay, and this conjecture, this consequence does have a name. Uh, it's called polynomial. Uh, oh, actually, let me say one more thing. Um, Suppose that you could prove this, that if the density is at least alpha, then the four times subset contains a subspace of co-dimension this, contains all of it. Then 
it's not hard, I won't prove this in the class, but it's not too hard to boost it to a, a statement where this is a hypothesis. Remember that I told you before, like, generally in these things, if you prove something about big sets, then you can translate it into a similar statement about sets that um, don't expand much when you do the sum set. And in particular, if you could prove this, that translation process would give you the following thing, that if mu of a plus a was not too much bigger than mu of a, uh, let's say at most a 1 over alpha times it, then a plus a plus a plus a contains a subspace of co-dimension log 1 over alpha. Okay, so if you could prove this in particular, uh, which would follow if you could prove this most strong conjecture, then some not too hard techniques show this stronger statement about a general set A. And this thing has a name. This one is called polynomial Bogolyubov conjecture. Oh, sorry, this is actually wrong. Hold on. I'm glad you were satisfied, but I'm not satisfied. Uh, this is wrong. Because this is really not possible, right? A could be like an incredibly tiny set, and then how could A plus A plus A plus A contain like a giant set that's almost the size 2 to the n? What you do want to say is that it contains a subspace, let's say H, with large uh, density such that mu of h is at least polynomial in alpha times mu of a. Okay, so the conclusion is that it contains a subspace whose size is not much smaller than the size of a. Okay, that makes sense back up here. Back up here, you're imagining a is already, I don't know, an alpha fraction of everything anyway. So uh, subspace of codimension o log 1 over alpha has density like polynomial in alpha. Okay. So th you could say the conclusion here, you get a subspace whose its density is at most polynomial in alpha times the density of A, or times 1. And that's the conclusion that you get down here. You know, that the only way you can be not too much bigger when you form A plus A is if, you know, four sums of A contains a quite a big subspace. Okay, and this polynomial in the name refers to the fact that the subspace you get is of density polynomially, only polynomially smaller than that of A. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So that's a strong and well-known conjecture. Um, this polynomial Bogolyabov conjecture it's also known to imply a somewhat weaker conjecture, which is even more famous. Maybe it's almost like the most famous conjecture in additive combinatorics. So this polynomial Bogolyov, Bogolyabov, also it's not hard to show that it implies this polynomial Freiman Ruscha conjecture. which is sort of, as I said, one of the most famous conjectures in the area. And that one says that if A is a set such that it doesn't get too much bigger when you form the sum set, then um, there exists an affine subspace, let's say X plus H, uh, which is not that much larger than A. Okay, so it's not much larger than A, yet it contains a good chunk of A. Okay, so it's sort of like saying A is weakly, it's, it's actually nice because there's a condition about A, not about like some sets of A. It says, okay, A is not a, sum, uh, a subspace, but there is a subspace which is not too much bigger, which uh, intersects A a lot. 
Okay, so like A is some blob, but there's like some real subspace that looks like a square, which is not much bigger and contains a good chunk of A. Okay, and let me bring this conjecture. I, I kind of prefer this conjecture the most. It's somehow simpler to state, but this one is also nice in that it's equivalent to a very nice statement about property testing. It kind of brings us back to lecture one or lecture two in the class. So uh, here's a statement which is actually known to be equivalent. Again, this is all not too hard. Equivalent to the Freiman -Ruge, polynomial Freiman Ruge conjecture. It's uh, the following. Suppose f is a function from f2 to the n, not into f2, which is what we've mostly talked about in the course, but into f2 to the n. And suppose you do like the most natural linearity test for it, you know, to try to check if it's a linear function from f2 to the n into f2 to the n. So you pick x and y uniformly at random and independently, and you just check if f of x plus f of y equals f of x plus y. Okay, and this addition is happening inside f2 to the n. Uh, and suppose the function passes this with pretty good probability, at least epsilon. Then you might hope that f is sort of close to an actual linear function. And uh, the desired conclusion is that f is polynomial in epsilon close to an actual linear function. So this is something you might hope is true. It's not known if it's true. Um, but the statement of it, that this linearity test sort of captures linearity up to a polynomial factor, is equivalent to this polynomial freiman ruge conjecture. OK, so this is something that we really, I mean, it's a very nice statement. We would hope it's true. Um, as we'll, I'll say in a second, something weaker than this is known to be true. And one way you could try to prove it is to go all the way back and just try to prove this conjecture, which I like. Yeah? Say that you knew the S range was F2 to the K. Yeah. Uh, is there like a, is it the K like exponentially? Is that the conjecture at least? How that probability goes down with K? Okay, it's actually equivalent to. Uh, this n doesn't even have to be n. I want to say it's actually, you can just put m here. Uh, I mean, if m is 1. Yeah, if m is 1, then it's kind of trivial. I mean, maybe, uh, 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 wait, there's also, hold on, there's also something slightly uh, wrong here. Uh, this does not make sense. The epsilons are going the wrong way. I mean, if I make epsilon smaller here, it's getting like a weaker and weaker hypothesis, like, oh, it's sort of slightly passes the test. But this conclusion is getting stronger and stronger. It's like getting even more and more close to linear. So this is a mistake. Good thing we caught this. Uh, what you want to say is that uh, sort of the opposite. There exists a truly linear G such that uh, F and G are slightly correlated. Okay, that's a better looking statement. So it like, makes sense in that it gets worse as uh, epsilon gets smaller and smaller. And so I think it's, you know, for example, I think this is known to be correct if m is 2. Uh, right? I think so. Uh, so maybe I'm going crazy, but like, if m was 1, 
Yeah. Wouldn't you expect that epsilon to be like a half plus epsilon? Yeah. I mean, it would be a more natural statement, at least, if m were, if this epsilon were a half plus epsilon when m is 1. So, um, and uh, like when m is 2, you would... Sorry, I meant to say, when I said, I meant to say m equals 1 when I said m equals 2. Uh, yeah. What I mean to say, so really, uh, this should say, like, uh, for all m, this holds where this does not depend on m. And probably, for a given m, this statement is probably does not become interesting until, like, epsilon is at least, uh, I don't know, 1 over 2 to the m. I think it's probably, maybe it's like vacuously true if epsilon is smaller than 1 over 2 to the m. But it should be that there's like a fixed polynomial relationship here, like this is epsilon, this is like epsilon to the 10th, such that holds for every m. Okay? Or maybe I could have like bypassed all this difficulty just by writing like f2 to the infinity there. But, yeah. Okay, does that clear up the confusion somewhat? Okay. Okay, good. So, uh, great. So this is a property testing statement that would be nice. And so it would be very nice to prove this conjecture. Um, okay, so for a while, not a lot was known on this conjecture. And the best thing, basically, you know, instead of having polynomial, polynomial, polynomial everywhere, it had exponential. And then, not too long ago, this guy Schoen got this exponential down to like some sort of 2 to the quasi-polynomial, something that was sub-exponential. But then, shortly thereafter, it was improved a great deal by Sanders. So next class, we'll see this result of Sanders from 2010, which proves this conjecture with a, to the power of 4 here. And that's pretty good, because it translates, you know, instead of polynomial in alpha, this becomes like 2 to the log to the fourth one over alpha. So it's quasi-polynomial in alpha. Okay, and all the translation goes through. So like, you know, with the Sanders result, you get quasi-polynomial in epsilon, which is pretty good. I mean, it would be still great to actually fully prove this conjecture, but this Sanders theorem we'll do next time gets fairly close. Okay, so uh, the Sanders theorem is a bit complicated. It's not too bad. We can do it in one lecture. But for the rest of this class, I want to do an easier theorem that's sort of of this flavor. It'll kind of warm us up a little bit. And it'll also show you this style of argument that comes up a lot in additive combinatorics called uh, density increment argument. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's only increasing, right? Uh, yeah, this should be 2 to the minus. Sorry, I'm making a lot of mistakes today. 2 to the minus. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right, so as alpha, it's a bit awkwardly phrased. As alpha decreases here, or as you're making like a weaker hypothesis, like the sum set doesn't grow that much, you know, the size of the subspace that you capture with four copies of A is, gets smaller and smaller, but... Yeah. Also, strictly speaking, I guess formally the polynomial Bogoliubov conjecture doesn't insist on four copies of A here. You can... I think maybe officially you're allowed any constant number of copies of A. And that's still strong enough to deduce the polynomial Freiman Riesz conjecture. And conversely, if you're tough, I think you could also still conjecture it with just three copies of A. Uh, and in fact, that's, uh, we're going to talk about a, a related statement now. Okay. So today, we're going to prove uh, an easier to prove variant. It's a theorem which actually is also due to Sanders from before. Um, and it's going to try to prove something like this statement, that if you have a, a big set, then the four-way sum set contains all of a big subspace. 
Um, but instead of getting the desired co-dimension, O of log 1 over alpha, it's just going to get 1 over alpha, which is exponentially worse, but, well, it's easier to prove. So here's the statement of the theorem. Say that A is a subset of F2 to the N, and the density of A is some alpha. Um, then, if you look at A plus A plus A, it contains all of a affine subspace. of co-dimension at most 1 over alpha. Um, okay, so in light of this conjecture, you could have maybe potentially hoped for log 1 over alpha. Here we get 1 over alpha. Um, okay. And philosophically, I think it's a bit actually... Uh, yeah, sorry. That's all I'll say about that. Okay, any questions? I'm going to probably just, this will probably occupy the rest of the class proving this. No. No, it's not, okay, th I should have said that at the very beginning. It said cannot contract. I sh yeah, forgot to say this. The density of A plus A is always at least the density of A. And that's because one way to see that is that A plus A certainly contains A0 plus A for any fixed A0 in A. And this thing has the same size as A because you cannot get any con collisions if you just take everything in A and add like a fixed element. It just translates them around. Yeah. So yeah, I should probably actually nevertheless put some quantifiers in here, like for all, I don't know, 0 less than alpha less than 1. Okay, good. I should have said that 45 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, so in your A plus A conjecture, if you replace the 99% with the 100%, right. is, it no, is this the best you can do? Or? Uh, good question. So actually, uh, let me state a theorem which I would uh, prove if I had time. Uh, but I'll just state it. This proof is uh, maybe 10% harder than the proof of this theorem. But we don't have that much time. So uh, another theorem, which is... Okay, so the, the question that John's asking is, suppose you're very you know, greedy and demanding and you say, you know, I, I assume I have a set A of density at least alpha, and I want A plus A to contain all of a big subspace. How big can I make that subspace? Um, well, if you look at the Hamming ball uh, example, here's another potential conjecture. It basically conjectures that for that question, the Hamming ball example is the worst. Okay, so this is a conjecture, which actually I like this one quite a lot too. Um, Let's say if mu of A is at least 1 over 1,000, and again, I don't know the correct asymptotics of every parameter here, but a nice conjecture is if mu of A is at least 1 over 1,000, then A plus A contains all of a s affine subspace of co-dimension O of root n. Okay, so this, is a b this statement is a bit of a different flavor than all these other conjectures because there's an n showing up in it. But uh, this is best, this, if true, would be best possible because the Hamming ball of this radius, um, if you think about it for five minutes, you see that, you know, uh, it actually, the biggest affine subspace it contains is one of dimension n minus O of root n. Um, okay. And you may ask about what's the best thing known along these lines. The best thing is a theorem also due to Sanders uh, that says the following. Um, let A 
be a subset of F2 to the n, uh, and let alpha be the density of A, then A plus A contains an affine subspace of dimension omega alpha n. So it's quite bad compared to this. You know, its co-dimension is like uh, 1 minus theta of alpha n, okay? So this, tell, this conjecture is that you contain, you know, like a, a, a subspace whose dimension is like n minus something little of n. And this is only giving you like, you know, a small fraction of n in dimension. So it's quite far off from the truth. Well, okay, it's quite far off from the conjecture. Um, Actually, if you're a bit careful with the parameters, he also shows, and this is a nice fact to know, if alpha is like a half minus epsilon, then the dimension, uh, actually, uh, actually the co-dimension, I'm doing this from memory, so I'm not sure I'm getting it right, is I think n over log 1 over epsilon. So if alpha is like really close to a half, then you can get something somewhat better. Uh, yeah. If you want a bigger, uh, yeah, big O would be correct. Okay, so this theorem is uh, not too hard to prove. We could also do it in 20 minutes. Um, it's very far off from the conjecture, actually. I like this conjecture very much, too. I like both of these conjectures, but this one is nice. It appeals to me a little bit more because I love sort of like hamming balls, you know, so I'm interested in this one. Okay, good question. Any more questions? Okay, so let's finally do some Fourier analysis and prove this theorem written in red. Okay. So actually, the first 50% of this proof is something that you already did on your homework. It was like homework one, number six, or something. But I'll repeat it anyway. Okay, so uh, we got some set A. And it's got some density, alpha, and we're trying to show that it contains a, sorry, we're trying to show that A plus A plus A contains like a giant subspace, one that has almost full dimension. Okay, so, um, well, if A plus A plus A is everything, then we're done. It's an easy first step. Okay, now we have to do more. Uh, okay, otherwise, there is some x which is not in A plus A plus A. Okay, so far so trivial. Uh, now, in fact, let me phrase it in a funny way, the same statement. I'll say that if you were to pick three elements, A, B, and C, uniformly from A and independently, and you were to look at A plus B plus C, probability that that would equal x is zero. I guess those are equivalent statements. Okay, so uh, let's look at this experiment. Uh, I should say, by the way, this is an important point. A plus A plus A is a set. And the uniform distribution over that set is, in general, like extremely different from the distribution you get by choosing A, B, and C independently from A and adding them. Okay? The distribution you get uh, when you draw A, B, and C from A and add them up is certainly a distribution which is supported on A plus A plus A, but it's quite different from the uniform distribution on A plus A plus A in general. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let's go back to like lecture two, maybe even lecture one. Uh, 
If I were to just pick one A uniformly at random from capital A, the probability density function for that uh, distribution we denote by phi sub A, right? It's the indicator of A over alpha. So does somebody remember the uh, density function for the distribution you get when you draw three things of A and add them up? Yeah, it's the convolution three times of A. In general, if you recall, like drawing A from A and then B from B and then like outputting A plus B, this has a uh, probability density function, which is phi A star phi B. It's by definition, I don't know why I wrote B there. Uh, it's phi A star phi A star phi A. Okay, so uh, what this is saying is, you know, this particular string x has probably zero under this distribution. So, you know, this equals zero. I'll write it over here. This equals zero. Um, okay, so this is equivalent to this. So now finally we'll use some uh, Fourier analysis. Uh, we'll just write the Fourier expansion of this. So it's uh, the sum over once I'm in F2 to the end, I like to call my characters by gamma rather than S, a set of phi A star phi A star phi A hat gamma times this chi gamma of X. Okay, I hope you guys remember all this stuff. We mostly did it on the homework, but this is like minus one to the gamma dot X. Okay, this is like the F2 N notation for, for parities or characters. Okay, and we also know that if you take the Fourier transform of a convolution, like it multiplies the Fourier transforms, right? So this is sum over gamma and F2 to the N of uh, phi A hat gamma cubed times chi gamma X. All right, let me continue it over here. Um, okay, so much like it's actually looking very much like the BLR analysis, BLR linearity test analysis. It's really not too different, actually. Um, okay, and one thing that we'll do now is uh, separate the sum, we'll separate out the gamma equals zero term. That's always a special term. So let me continue this up here. This is, uh, well, it's phi A uh, of zero cubed times chi zero of gamma plus the sum over gamma not zero of should be x. Okay. Uh, okay. Chi zero of x is just one, right? This is the constant coefficient. And what is, uh, can somebody tell me phi a hat of zero? Well, that's why you did all those homeworks. Oh. No. Nope. Yes. Right. Chi hat A of zero. It's the constant coefficient, so it's the expected value of this function. Okay, and a probability density function is like defined, like one of its defining elements is that its expectation is one. Okay, it's like its integral is one. Okay, so this actually, this whole thing is one. And uh, let me just use the fact that this number is either plus or minus one. And I'll just say that this is therefore greater than or equal to, well, this equals one. And now I'll just uh, do s minus the sum of the absolute values. OK, that step's OK, I assume, especially if you remember the homework. Then whenever we have this uh, sum of Fourier coefficients cubed, we always do the same thing. This is at least one minus, we'll take out one with the max. And we'll leave the rest in the sum. Okay. That's going to demand somebody tell me this. What is the, this equal to, but I'll give you a little help. Uh, okay, this thing, 
do it in a different color. Well, let's first figure out this. What is the sum over all gammas of phi a hat gamma squared? It's the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficient. So we know by Parseval, this is equal to the expected value of phi a squared. Okay, can somebody tell me this? I'll do one more step for you. It's expected value of the definition of this is the indicator of A over the density of A, which is alpha squared. Now you've got to be able to tell me this. Yeah, one over alpha. I'll even do one more step for you. This is either one or zero. So it's the expectation of one A, one over alpha squared. Right, which is alpha over alpha squared, which is 1 over alpha. Great. You did it. Uh, it's 1 over alpha. Slow day. Okay, so can somebody tell me this? Oh, I was making a lot of mistakes at the board, too, so I cannot blame you. Okay, so what is that thing in red that I circled? Yeah, we're good. We're, we can do the subtractions. So this is 1 over alpha minus 1, because the thing that you left off is phi hat alpha 0 squared, and we decided that that was 1. Phew. Okay, great. So, uh, therefore, this is at least 1 minus the max over non-zero gamma, the Fourier coefficient, times, okay, I'm also going to write 1 over alpha minus 1 as uh, 1 minus alpha over alpha. Great. So I'm going to move, uh, on the left-hand side I have 0, right? I'm going to move this whole thing to the left-hand side and then divide by 1 minus alpha over alpha so that I'll get that the maximum Fourier coefficient in absolute value is at least alpha over 1 minus alpha. Okay, so here's the grand finale of this first part, which was the finale of the homework. Uh, okay, so there exists some non-zero Fourier coefficient uh, such that phi a hat gamma 1 is at least alpha over 1 minus alpha. All right, great. Now, uh, let me say, um, it's not exactly clear why this is without loss of generality, but it'll become clear. So let me just assume without loss of generality that phi a uh, hat gamma 1 is non-negative. So this is, well, positive. So this is at least alpha over 1 minus alpha. Okay, let's just assume it's positive, not negative. Okay, so let's remember what this is. It's the Fourier coefficient. So this is phi a inner product with chi gamma 1. This is the probability density function. So if you take an inner product of a density with like a function, it's like the expectation of that function under the density. So this is equal to the expected value over A drawn uniformly from A of chi gamma 1 A. Okay, so this chi gamma 1 of A is either plus or minus 1, and we're saying its expectation on the set capital A is like a little bit big. It's bigger than alpha over 1 minus alpha. So let me draw a picture. Uh, F2 to the n, our domain, is like the hypercube, you know? And uh, sort of gamma 1 uh, like splits it into two subspaces. Well, like the subspace of everything that's perpendicular to gamma 1 and the coset, you know, everything that has dot products one with gamma one. So I may sort of draw the picture as like, it splits F2 to the n into two parallel hyperplanes. Sort of a slightly misleadingly geometric way to draw it. Uh, but this would be, let's say, all the, this would be the subspace of all, let's say, x such that gamma one of x equals zero. Or you might call that gamma one perp. And this is like the other coset. Uh, 
you know, all the x such that gamma 1 x equals 1. Okay? It divides the, hyper, uh, the hypercube into half. You know, if gamma 1 were really like, uh, like a degree 1 coefficient, this would be like splitting the cube in an axis parallel way, like in this drawing, where like, you know, first coordinate is 0, first coordinate is 1. Okay, in general it's not, but, you know, geometrically it's like a, a subspace and like a parallel affine subspace. And so some part of A, you know, lives up here, right? This is a, I should also say this is the part, this is a, you could also write a set of x such that chi gamma 1 of x is 1, and this is the set of x is such that chi, oops, chi gamma 1 x is minus 1. Okay, so A is a set, and it gets divided into two pieces, like, uh, there's some part of A up here, I'll call that A plus, and there's some part of A down here, I'll call that A minus. Okay, A is some subset of F2 to the N. Uh, now, which of these two sets is bigger, A plus or A minus? To answer that question, you should look at this inequality. Yes, that's right, A plus Y. Yeah, exactly. So look at this experiment. You draw a random point from the set capital A, and you like, you know, compute chi gamma 1 of A. So like, you draw a random point from A, the union of these two red sets. If it's up here, you compute 1. If it's down here, you compute minus 1. And the fact that we know is that this expectation is positive. In fact, it's bigger than this alpha over 1 minus alpha. So you know, you're more likely to be on this hyperplane than this hyperplane. Okay, so A plus is sort of bigger than A minus. I mean, it's, in fact, it's sort of its relative density inside this hyperplane is bigger than alpha, and the relative density of A minus inside this hyperplane is smaller than alpha. Okay, so what we sort of found here is we found a hyperplane on which A sort of looks bigger than it was before. The density of A, which is formerly alpha, has gone up. Okay, so this is why it's called the density increment argument. We've used some Fourier analysis to find this hyperplane where the set A looks bigger. Okay, and we're going to iterate this argument sort of within this hyperplane in a second. Okay, so let's just be a bit more precise about the, the conclusion we've just drawn. Um, so... Let's get some notation. Let's say the density of A plus, and here when I write the density of A plus, I just really mean its density within the entire F2 to the N. Um, let's call it 1 plus epsilon times alpha over 2. I'll say why I write it this way in a second, and we'll call the density of A minus 1 minus epsilon times alpha over 2. Okay, you see, A is the disjoint union of A plus and A minus, so the sum of the densities of A plus and A minus should be alpha. Okay, so in some sense, it's without loss of generality to write it like this, because these are two numbers that sum over to alpha. And I've written it like this because I know in the back of my head that this guy has bigger density than this guy, okay? So I can write it like this for some non-negative epsilon. Okay, and which non-negative epsilon? Um, well... I'll just translate exactly what this inequality is saying. Okay, this, having written it this, this inequality is precisely saying uh, that, you know, with probability, uh, okay, when I draw a random point from A, the probability that it's in A plus is exactly half 1 plus epsilon, all right? This is the probability that A is in A plus, given that I drew it uniformly from A, right? Because the density of A is alpha. So it's just this over alpha. Uh, 
and then the probability that I get something in A minus is a half 1 minus epsilon. And when that happens, I count minus 1. Okay, here I count 1. Okay, so this is uh, half plus half epsilon minus a half plus minus a half times one minus epsilon. So uh, that's epsilon. Okay, and the the hypothesis of star is that that's at least alpha over one minus alpha. Okay, so. Star tells me this fact about epsilon. Not only is it not negative, it's at least this big. Uh, and so what we've concluded is that the density of A plus is at least, uh, well, if I do 1 plus this, I'll get 1 over 1 minus alpha, right? So I get uh, 1 over 1 minus alpha times alpha over 2. Okay? People agree with that computation? Okay, and so that's fine, but as I said, I want to inter iterate this argument. So the conclusion I'm going to draw from this is that A plus's density, not overall, but it's like relative density within this subspace, has gone, it's a bigger than alpha. Okay, so the relative density of A plus in, you know, gamma 1 perp is at least... Well, basically, you just double this, right? Because the subspace takes up half of the full hypercube. So it's at least 1 over 1 minus alpha times alpha. Okay, so this is the main deduction that I've made. This is the density increment. Uh, this is mu A plus over mu... Okay, let me also... I've given it, like, five names. Let me call this H1 this hyperplane, H1. It's a little bit bigger than alpha, right? This is a number slightly bigger than one. <coughs> okay, so, oh, I'm almost out of time. All right, well, I'm almost done as well. Uh, okay, so we're basically home free now. Uh, what I want to say is, this gamma 1 perp, the subspace, is basically isomorphic to F to n minus 1. I mean, it's an n minus 1 dimensional subspace. So let me, I want to set A1 to be this A plus and then, like, repeat. Okay, I have now, like, this A1 sitting inside here. It's a density slightly bigger than alpha subspace of its ambient uh, hypercube. And, you know, I repeat the whole argument. So if A1 plus A1 plus A1 is, you know, everything, then I'm, let's say I'm done. I'll come back to this in a second. I've, well, in particular, what I've got is then A1 plus A1 plus A1 equals H1, and this is uh, contained in A plus A plus A. And so that I have that A plus A plus A contains this big co-dimension one subspace. Okay, otherwise, you know, I again, I find a large Fourier coefficient of the density function from A1. That gives me another affine subspace. <coughs> of H1 call it H2, okay, and it has co-dimension 2, on which, you know, the restriction A2 to uh, H2 has density at least, well, it'll be the exact same formula with the improved density in place of the original density. Uh, so it'll be like this formula, but with 
get plugged into itself. So I'll get, let me call this alpha over 1 minus alpha. I'll get alpha over 1 minus alpha over 1 minus alpha over 1 minus alpha, which if you compute is alpha over 1 minus 2 alpha. Okay, so it's like an even bigger subset. Okay, and again, if I, you know, further repeat the argument on this subspace, k times, you get some set a k inside a uh, co-dimension k subspace, affine dimension subspace, of density at least alpha over 1 minus k alpha. Okay, so it's going up and up and up and up. And basically, this can happen at most 1 over alpha times, you know, because the density cannot exceed 1. <coughs> so the density increment can happen at most 1 over alpha times. Uh, otherwise, this number goes above 1. And so, at some point, you stop, and you get that A plus A plus A, or AK plus AK plus AK contains all of HK. For some K, that's at most 1 over alpha. Okay, and this is a, still a subset of A, so A plus A plus A contains this uh, fine subspace as well. Okay, any questions? Right, so this is a very kind of typical argument in additive combinatorics. And next time we'll see Sanders' theorem, which uh, combines several more ideas to get a much stronger result. <laughs>